everybody and welcome. My name is Kristen Lobish and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Youth with Sexual Behavior Problems, Practical Resources and Activities for Therapists Working with Youth and Their Families, presented by our colleague Renee McCreary, whose soon to be released Neary Press book of the same name is the focus of this webinar today. Before turning this over to Renee, I want to take a few moments to tell you about Neary Press. Our mission is to share cutting-edge research and best practices emerging in our field. For many years, we accomplished this mission only through book sales. But with changes in the last several years in the publishing and technology worlds, we've been compelled to continue our mission by expanding how we disseminate knowledge in new ways. So over the last six years, we've also offered online courses, a free monthly newsletter, in-person trainings, and these webinars delivered by all of our internationally recognized authors and other experts in the field. It's important to us at Neary Press and Training Center to hear from you what kinds of information, training, resources, and books you want and need to be the best professional that you can be. So please contact us with your suggestions, input, questions, and feedback, rather pos positive or negative. I'll talk more about this at the end of the webinar, but I just want to make the pitch that if you find these webinars helpful, we hope you'll consider becoming a sponsor of the series. Like NPR and other public services, it's your sponsorship that really helps make this series happen and allows us to offer these webinars every year for free to thousands of clinicians and other professionals who participate in them around the world, as we know. Please consider becoming a sponsor of the webinar series. Being a sponsor will guarantee you a seat for every webinar in the entire series. We will register, register you ahead of time for free. 15 staff, staff members of your organization, if you are an organization, and will offer you a free gift of two of Neary Press's books and mention you in all of our publicity about the webinar series and at each webinar. Before we get started with Renee's presentation, there are a few more things I'd like to share. As with all workshops, I want to let you know the learning objectives, which are on your screen. Participants will learn the value of using research-based based methodology when working with youth with sexual behavior problems, learn three specific research-based interventions, and be inspired to support families in increasing supportive interactions and identifying their strengths and those of their kids. Second, I want to let you know that the slides are already posted, as Elisa mentioned, uh, both on the Neary Press website and you can get them straight from your GoToWebinar control panel. The YouTube recording will be posted on the Neary Press website within a week after the webinar's completion. Next, we want you to know that when the workshop is over, you can, if you can please answer our short, short survey at the end, we would love your feedback. And if you can be patient, in about a week after the webinar, we'll send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording, certificate of attendance, and with the slides. So within a week, you should have all of that in your inbox. And meanwhile, you can download the slides right here from your control panel on the right-hand side. So now I will introduce our speaker, Renee McCreary. She is the Counseling Director at the Metropolitan Organization to Counter Sexual Assault, or MOCSA. Renee has been working with sexually abusive families since 1985, and at MOCSA, Renee leads the counseling team in providing care to child and adult victims of sexual abuse and assault, in addition to overseeing the programs for youth with sexual behavior problems adolescents with illegal sexual behaviors, and adult sex offenders. She has worked in both inpatient and outpatient settings. I'd like to make a pitch briefly before we begin the webinar for Renee's forthcoming Neary Press book of the same name as her webinar. This magnificent guide for clinicians and others who work with kids with sexual behavior problems and their families will be released in January of 2018. But it is available to pre-order from Neary Press Bookstore now. And if you pre-order this book as a webinar attendee, you get a special 15% discount using the code JN, 
janu15 at checkout um, in our online bookstore up until January 14th, 2018. It looks like it'll be a wonderful book. I really hope that you decide to order it. To tell you a bit about this book, um, and you'll get a clearer sense, I'm sure, once I'm done talking and Renee is presenting, the guide is based on cutting-edge research regarding the most effective therapeutic interventions for treating youth with sexual behavior problems. The book provides practical activities for reducing sexual behavior problems, strengthening warm family interactions, and improving parents' supervision and communication practices so therapists can feel more equipped to support and treat these young people and families. And now I'll stop talking and hand this over to our presenter to do her presentation. Here you go, Renee. Hi, Kristen. Thank you, uh, Elisa and Kristen. I appreciate you inviting me on for this. Um, I'm not sure that my slideshow is up. Can you give me a nod about that? There we go. You should have uh, be able to put it up now, Renee. All right. Um, are you guys seeing it? Not My, yet. Okay. We may need to remove your camera for a minute and put the slides up first. Can you see my slides now? Not yet, no. Okay. Um, hmm. Audience, please bear with us. This is where we need our usual tech advisor, who I mentioned, if you weren't on at the beginning, um, was was unable to be here because of a family emergency. And so I am punting. This is Elisa, uh, the director of Neary Press and Training Center, punting as the tech advisor without um, lots of tech skills. So please bear with us for just a moment. And I'm going to try and get you able to put your slides up, Renee, just a minute. Hmm. Well, ah, I, can, can I, you see me now? No. Maybe you can put your camera up. Oh, your camera's up. My camera's up. Um, and if we can't get your slides up, Renee, then you may have to do your presentation without the slides. Okay, that's great. Um, I'll just go ahead and, and get started. I think people have access to the slides on their computers, um, and I've called for some help. So um, for some reason, my slides aren't up, Lauren. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, all right, so thank you, and thank you for your patience. I was concerned I might have a little bit of difficulty with that. My uh, tech skills are not the best, so I apologize if I'm the one who did that. So uh, Kristen mentioned that I'm with MOXA, and MOXA is actually a large rape crisis center. We provide advocacy and um, and counseling and education for individuals that, that we see. In our counseling program, I put up a, a slide which is really a prompt for myself um, and not for y'all because it's hard to read um, that uh, you may, can, can you see this now, Elisa? I still don't see your slides now. I'm still not seeing it. Okay. Um, anyway, this, so this slide is, it's hard to see anyway, uh, but I put it up to help me remember to mention what Kristen already mentioned, thank you, uh, that we have counseling services for individuals across the continuum of care. So uh, we have counseling services for children and adolescents who've experienced sexual abuse or assault, and we have programming for um, youth with sexual behavior problems, for adolescents Renee, with illegal Renee, sexual behavior. Renee, you see your slides now. You can? Okay, great. Yay! Yay! Um, and um, still can't see me, though? We can see you and your slides. Oh. Yeah, my slides. Great. Hi, everybody. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Lauren. So uh, it, it's unusual in that we have that programming across the continuum. And it's also uh, an important element about how I ended up uh, writing this treatment guide because, because of our work primarily really with um, individuals 
children who'd experienced sexual abuse, we uh, were called upon a lot uh, to reach out or to meet the needs of kids that had uh, struggles with sexual behavior problems. And in about 2009, I decided I wanted to begin to do this better than we had been doing it. And I approached this in the way that I approach most things, which is by going to the library and figuring out, so what works with this population? And obviously, at the time, uh, in 09, there were a lot of myths in our profession about these kids. And um, I worked with kids for a long time, and it just didn't make some of the myths that I was familiar with just didn't fit for me uh, in terms of, of treating kids. So a couple of the myths that I wanted to really respond to in a big way were uh, the idea that kids who had experienced or who were acting out sexually or had sexual behavior problems had, were kids who had experienced sexual abuse. Um, another piece was that these children would grow up uh, were can considered a threat to our community safety, and you know that that's not necessarily true. And um, so I was hoping to to impact that myth. And I think I've got some really exciting news in that I really do believe in the Kansas City area and the state of Missouri. We've made some really big differences, some really big changes in the ways that uh, we're providing, the way we conceptualize these kids' behaviors and then also the way that we're treating them. So we had, um, scooch my slides ahead, although they're not moving ahead. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So five primary initiatives uh, in 2009, and one was to develop a research-based treatment protocol. So uh, I feel really strongly about the importance of work being research-based. I've been doing work with uh, sexually abusive uh, People, individuals have experienced sexual abuse in one way or the other for a long time. And when I first started doing the work in 85, we really didn't have any idea what we were doing and we were making it up as we were going along. And so um, it's exciting to me that our, our, our world is changing and our field is changing and that we can now uh, refer to good research that's been done. And I'll talk a little bit more about some specific research elements that really inform this program in, in a minute. Um, I also wanted to do some training and create a, a different kind of a culture in Kansas City, which I mentioned that. Uh, we've also been able to create a different kind of a culture in our state as well. We've made um, had some real strong uh, uh, initiatives in our state too. Uh, we now have a multidisciplinary team that meets at MOXA uh, once a month where we work uh, on community safety around youth with sexual behavior problems and youth with illegal sexual behaviors. Uh, we changed the law, which is really exciting, Senate Bill 341. So our CEO are, is kind of a force of nature anyway and she was on a governor's task force uh, against child abuse and there was, this is going to be a little boring to some people, and I won't talk about it for very long, but it's a really critical element. There was a, a practice in the state of Missouri for a long time that really befuddled and confused therapists. And um, the practice was that if there was no care, custody, or control. So if a child acted out and it was not like, babysitting or the Boy Scout leader or, you know, didn't have some kind of official uh, mandate to take care of this child, uh, there was no way that our state could provide any kind of support or services to the kids. And so it might be a clear case of child abuse and we would call it into the authorities, but there would be no action that would be taken. And so now with Senate Bill 341, even when there's no care, custody, or control, any time a child acts out uh, against another child, uh, our state can provide uh, both assessment and treatment referrals to uh, families. So that was a really exciting change in the way that we're working. Um, and then also we wanted to implement an evidence-based treatment. And the two evidence-based treatments are the OUPSB model, which I hope a lot of you are familiar with. It's an incredible uh, uh, program and that's what we're currently implementing uh, and then also the the MST model which we don't do but it was an evidence-based treatment we um, are not doing so um, looking at the research again I'm going to just talk about three pieces of research I uh, love the idea I was in uh, 
trained as a strength based therapist and I love the idea that the, of the difference that makes the difference and so the meta analysis uh, done by Solovsky and others um, found that in the programming in, in 2009 in the programming that was being done with children there were these five elements that existed in these programs that were the difference that were making a difference in the treatment program with the kids so um, you can see them there up on the slide and uh, so all of these have been integrated into our programming here another just interesting piece again that most of you know already is that in 202 I mean 002 um, in a survey done by the Safer Society uh, a lot of adult elements elements of adult sex offender treatment programming um, were being used and the way I tell that story is that you know we started noticing adolescents were also acting out that oh we need to do programming for them and then we, we thought oh we have a great program we can use these adult models and uh, and then we noticed the kids were in need of some additional programming and we said oh that's awesome we have these adolescent models that we can use with kids so um, in working with kids when I first started looking at different programming in 09 that people were using there were a lot of a lot of adult sex offender models that had been um, inadequately uh, adjusted uh, down to use for youth and one of the things that I love about the program that we've developed here at MOXA is uh, that it is very developmentally appropriate it really was designed for working with kids so um, anyway then this other article, this is a last research article that I'll, that I'll present and I'll give you enough information that you can find them on your own if you like. But I love this line that most situations that involve sexual behaviors in young children do not require child protective services intervention. So um, I think one of the challenges in working with youth with sexual pr behavior problems is finding the right size treatment and you know we have had a tendency to either under respond and or to over respond but have really had a difficulty getting uh, our responses in the middle and you know I hope that I hope that this kind of program I've never really sure what to to call it a treatment protocol a program is um, supporting therapists in both following your own intuition good clinical intuition and um, using some good research-based uh, treatment interventions at the same time and helping you find uh, the right size treatment for the kids that you're working with so um, not too much not too little so in the model that I developed the um, uh, there are three things that I think are important one is that it's research-based um, it's also strengths based uh, which is really important and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we move forward and then also I think it needs to be fun and the main reason I think it needs to be fun um, is one because it's fun to have fun um, but also because um, the family it's it's a really positive way to show respect for people that we work with um, and it also sends a message of of strength and um, it also encourages families when they need to uh, to come back so we're not treating them as though you know this is some terrible crisis that can't be solved uh, but that this is a a, 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 a difficulty that's happening um, with the child that they're responsible for caring for uh, that's solvable um, so that's I think it sends a good positive message all right so last things first so the very last piece of all this programming that we developed and we just developed it uh, last year is a response to youth who are um, looking at and, and using pornography and this is anecdotal and not research based but it does seem like there is an increase in it it makes sense that there would be in that you know um, when I first started doing this work people didn't have access to computers at all and now you know there's just a real high level we all have a really high level um, of access to digital elements uh, telephones iPods computers etc 
and kids have easy access to pornography. We all have uh, easy access to pornography on our computers. And um, I actually hadn't planned to say that, but I just thought of it now when I said we all have high access. Uh, it is interesting in our pornography workshop that we've started doing, we do it three times a year, how uh, engaged the parents are, not just as caregivers, but also kind of sharing some of their own experiences when we talk about what kinds of feelings are you having uh, when you make a decision to look at pornography. And uh, you can tell the parents' wheels are really churning and sometimes they they decide to share. But um, recently I heard Marie Crabb say that of the 50 most viewed pornographic films, 88% of those films portray violence against women. So, you know, mixing uh, pornography with or sexuality with uh, violence is, I think, confusing for most people, um, but really difficult for kids to metabolize. So it makes sense to me uh, that they would be uh, acting out more around that when they have difficulty making sense of it. So um, a question I like, and it's on this, uh, on your slides, is uh, do you know what the first three apps are uh, that you look at uh, or that your kids look at when they go to their phone? Um, do you know the first three apps that your partner goes to when they look at their phone or your best girlfriend? Uh, it's kind of an interesting question and um, I, you know, just kind of a good thing to know. The, um, the, the work we do with families around pornography, uh, we certainly make resources available regarding limiting access uh, and different kinds of software. A lot of our clients really like the nanny net and have given us a lot of good feedback about that. Um, but uh, it's really more about monitoring, I mean, I'm sorry, about, about developing a culture of conversation and a culture of talking about it because it's one of the things we learned early on. Uh, early on when we first started hearing about the pornography, we talked a lot about monitoring and limiting and supervision, which are great. Um, and I totally support efforts in, in monitoring and supervision. Um, but also kids are having access to pornography on the school bus, at scout camp, at, um, you know, on the church bus, at school. Um, and school, in fact, is the place for our kids that we see uh, where they have the most access to pornography for a variety of different reasons. So, um, so kids are are going to probably have access to it. So, um, it's important to develop a culture where um, you're able to have conversations with your kids about that. So, um, all right. Okay, so now moving to the beginning of the book is um, assessment and safety planning. So um, these are together for a reason, and, and that's that I think we need to be working on these two things at the same time. And not only that, this is a, a, a big task for all of us therapists. We have a lot of um, requirements from accreditation uh, communities, from insurance companies, et cetera, about information that we need to gather on the first session oftentimes and or to bill for an assessment. Um, but uh, sometimes that's not necessarily what the family is needing. And I think uh, one of the most important elements is that uh, there's a book written years ago, what, uh, Single Session Therapy, I think was the name of it, by Moni Elkine. I think that's right. Anyway, and um, you know, he was suggesting that most families were only going to see one time and or most people come in one time for counseling. So let's figure out how to make that useful. And definitely, if you look just at our numbers, and I'm sure the numbers in any agency, um, it goes up. You know, uh, people come in and what may have an average of uh, six times or five times or eight times, whatever it is, and then that starts going down from there. So um, I think it's a really good idea to make really good use of that first session in weaving the assessment and the safety planning in together. Um, also, I mentioned kind of having fun, making it worthwhile for the family. So if I'm just capturing information for, from you to put in my system, because that's the requirement, um, that hasn't necessarily been useful to, to the clients that we work with. Um, 
but you know, really identifying strengths as people are coming in, um, and um, and identifying solutions, and uh, some of the some of the positive things are going on, and positive strategies also for safety planning, um, and then also being sure to do. Uh, to, leave, to let the family leave was something really useful, uh, something that was helpful, uh, uh, maybe a strategy that they identified as you were going through the assessment process, something that would, would support them and help them um, and um, uh, making their time useful. Also, I, I oftentimes say you're working for the mental health person behind you. Um, so number one, people are more likely to come back into counseling if they've had a good experience the first time. And it may or may not be you. It may be, a, you know, later sometime. Um, and uh, helping people kind of know what to expect from counseling. And I think oftentimes, especially in families where there are sexual behavior problems, there are families where there are oftentimes, at least research would support the idea uh, that oftentimes kids are from families with multiple kinds of struggles going on. And so they've had some negative interactions with the larger system. You may not be a part of the larger system. They may have accessed you on their own, um, they, although they may perceive you as being a part of the larger system and someone who has the power or potential to cause harm in some way. So I think we need to be really respectful in, in our interactions and have it be useful um, and get something done, I think. so. Um, all right, so on the assessment and safety planning, again, doing those together, I think there are three questions that we're looking at, uh, if we had to boil, boil it down. And the, the resource about assessment that's available in this book has a lot more questions than this. And uh, for those of you that have been doing this work for a long time, um, there, there may not be anything new. Um, for those of you that are new, uh, it may be scripted in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, anyway, I think, I think there's some good questions in there, uh, things that I've learned along the way. So, um, but ultimately, when, who, and where are true or questions that are useful, uh, and those are questions for both the assessment and the safety planning. So when did this occur? And so that's the assessment piece, when, when did, did this child, you know, behave in this way? Um, but then the safety planning is knowing when that happened. Is that a time after school, for instance, uh, where there's um, unsupervised and or unstructured time? Um, you know, who, uh, who was acting out and who was the child acting out on? And what were the um, kind of characteristics of, of each of those children? And um, I can go on into that and I won't, but you know, how did people find out? Who found out, et cetera? Um, and then where? So where did this happen? And then also in the safety planning piece, where do people need to be uh, to keep this from happening again. So moving on to uh, most of you, if you're listening to this, this is the, the question or the, the word uh, that defines most of our days is around boundaries. And uh, a couple of the things that I like to do, one's a little bit more fun than the other, but I like to do a family blueprint. And uh, so doing a blueprint actually of their house, um, I used to do in-home therapy. And I remember thinking how differently people's homes looked when I actually went to them than I had kind of made up in my brain when they were talking about their home. So I think that kind of gave me that, I, I want to see these rooms and, um, and where they are in terms of uh, ability to give line of sight supervision or um, who's sleeping where and, um, and how frequently. So um, do sometimes the children sleep uh, in the living room, if, and then sometimes they sleep in the in their bedrooms, or you know, just kind of again that that who, when, and where, um, and doing a family blueprint about that, and finding out what families see as the strengths. It may be small, and that might be a real strength for them in terms of uh, how they see themselves as being able to supervise. Um, Anyway, just listening to them for the strengths and what they see is some of the barriers that they also experience living in their homes in terms of uh, supervising their children and how they do. Um, also, a lot of families that we've worked with over the years, or I've worked with over the years, are families that are uh, 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 live in a variety of different places. And so finding something like a, a sleeping bag or a blanket that that child you know, can 
can identify as theirs, that it's folded in a certain way, that that's their space, that other kids uh, can't go in there. So really getting an idea about uh, the space that the family's living in and how that is utilized and what the strengths and barriers are for, for supervision. Uh, the family schedule is sort of basically the same thing and that's just looking at uh, the time. I'm pretty tedious about that by the way. Uh, the time they get up in the morning, who gets up at what time and I'll go through the whole day in a fairly can go through that in a fairly tedious way in finding out where things are working well for families uh, and where where things aren't working so well. Um, and as I'm thinking about it and talking about it being sort of tedious, I think, well, what's fun about that for the family? But I, I think the family is interested in uh, or sometimes kind of honored by our level of interest in how the, that how things are working for them and the things that are working well and what they identify as the strengths in their uh, family schedules. So. So feelings identification, I think um, when I work with parents, I, I really believe that this is one of the best abuse prevention pieces. So as a kid, if I don't have any sense of the differences that I feel, so I kind of don't notice the difference between feeling confused and scared and angry and happy, and there's just always this kind of hyper arousal sense of, um, excitement and I'm not able to differentiate it, I think that puts kids at risk. I think it makes makes things difficult for kids to name. So being able to, for a child to be able to name their feelings and to be able to name that concept of having mixed feelings and blended feelings uh, is really helpful to them in being able to identify um, those those protective fa factors. I also think this is jumping ahead in a way, but I also think this is um, these real mixed feelings, this real sense of hyper arousal is also oftentimes what motivates um, some of the impulse control struggles, which is definitely an issue that kids with sexual behavior problems um, are struggling with. So um, also in this particular chapter, the feelings identification chapter is a list of glove box questions and uh, they're called glove box questions because you can put them in the glove box of your car and uh, just to increase family conversation, um, identifying different types of feelings um, and, and supporting each other in that. Another, I'm going to back up just a little bit on the blend. Another thing that I hear people say a lot is kids will identify I was feeling sad or I was feeling mad um, and, and the parents will oftentimes respond um, so, so which one was it? Are you feeling sad or are you feeling mad? And um, as opposed to that the child was experiencing both uh, both sadness and anger at the same time and uh, kind of recognizing that that's just a, a very real experience. So um, a little thing that I think about a lot of times, is, and this is to do with the feelings piece, is that some old research supporting that when families ate dinner at the table together, uh, the kids made better grades. And um, I always thought that was kind of an interesting research project, but I, I really think that had to do with the fact that uh, families were having conversations with each other and, and doing a lot of uh, sharing with each other and uh, not so much to do with the broccoli and potatoes probably. All right, so distress tolerance. Um, so there are a number of different activities that you can use supporting distress tolerance, but I think that um, the idea that I like is I can have this feeling and not become it. And I think we oftentimes have this idea that if uh, another family member is angry that a way to join them and a way to be connected and feel connected with them is also to express anger um, and everyone can kind of get excited at the same time. Um, and yet, you know, having a discussion about that with the families and that actually, uh, that makes things feel less, less safe for us. And um, I, in my home growing up, that Rudyard Kipling poem was hanging on the wall, if you can keep your head when all about you, people are losing theirs. And um, I like just kind of having conversations with families about that and just um, maybe presenting a new way of thinking about uh, having feelings and about managing distress and that, you know, that feeling sad is fine and it can be 
good and something to embrace and um, that it also has a life of its own it shows up and then it goes away uh, and that we can have that feeling and that we don't have to become it so all right uh, cognitive distortions not by the way evidence-based um, but uh, in a little adult like actually I, I can't help myself with uh, having been trained as a cognitive behavioral therapist and I, I like cognitive distortions I like thinking about them because I think uh, they really help us take meta positions to ourselves and so um, the, the example that I oftentimes give and I won't go into it but is I always say I'm a big catastrophizer you know the the um, the faucet starts leaking and then I go through this big story then about how finally they're having to dig up the front yard and have to mortgage my house and uh, people always seem sort of shocked when I'm telling this story and um, but you know the the reality is that we all have cognitive distortions and um, I think that we as we develop our ability to have a meta position about that or to think about our thinking about that um, uh, and developing the ability so what you know what are the when I start thinking that the faucets leaking and I'm going to end up you know, being homeless as a result uh, being able to label that as uh, in kids language as a drama queen kind of a response and or uh, my more adult language and, and catastrophizing so um, and then also relabeling so how can I do that differently what would make more sense you know I could say to myself uh, gosh you know I noticed the faucets leaking and that makes me feel really worried um, but let me get some information about this and then uh, before I decide that I'm going to be homeless so let me get some information about it so uh, just talking that kind of thinking those thinking patterns out uh, I make available for adults list of cognitive distortions and kind of review them and then also have them identify three I call them it, I don't know that this is real strength space but I call the um, the labels the or the um, the thought I'm sorry the thought the bad idea and then we come up with three better ideas and then I write them on three by five cards with the kids in their in their caregiver so for instance a common example of a cognitive distortion uh, for caregivers of children that have had sexual behavior problems is I'm a bad mom and um, so that's not a very helpful thought or a very helpful stance for entering into parenting so hopefully um, rescripting that will help the families feel more or caregivers feel more empowered all right, so impulse control, definitely research-based um, that kids with sexual behavior problems are more likely to have trouble with impulsivity. And, uh, but it's hard to, hard to determine which kids in the assessment phase sometimes are uh, highly impulsive and because impulsivity is also a condition of youth. Um, but the reality is that practice can help and there are a variety of different um, strategies people can use to learn to slow down their actions and their thoughts and there are some fun games to do with families in this uh, uh, manual that are listed to support families in developing a language around uh, impulsivity and oftentimes parents so you know I think I struggle with impulsivity in many ways so and parents do too so all right I've got two more things to talk about and I'm done um, so the the family team building so the the focus of this whole program is not on the child's acting out obviously that's why the families are there that's the ultimate solution that we're looking for um, but the solutions are found in acting together um, acting together as a team and I also recognize that there are, are you know times when that doesn't work for a variety of different reasons that youth don't have access to um, caregivers but th I think they can still learn a lot of these skills so um, and three ideas about how fam each family member can be a helper this week and the one thing I know for sure working with families over all these years is that families want to be a team they want to work together they want to be that that family that they see that um, really pitches in so uh, I, that's something I know I can count on okay last couple of slides 
this actually is my favorite all-time technique um, that, I, that I've developed for working with families. So in the sexuality component, which is also one of my favorite components, even though uh, coming into all this, it was my least favorite to talk about, but I think about it in terms of relationship um, and uh, supporting families in being able to talk about you know, one of the most important elements of their lives. And so these, these four statements, that's interesting. I didn't know you thought that. Thanks for sharing your idea or thought or opinion. And can you tell me more? Um, that in a listening exercise, the kids are allowed to tell their parents anything. And their parents only have one of four responses. Uh, so also really great practice for parents or for caregivers in uh, monitoring themselves and even kind of looking at me and uh, when I first introduce it to parents when it's just or caregivers just them without their kids in the room um, and they're like are you kidding are you expecting me to use one of these responses I'm like I don't know what would that be like and so um, just exploring the idea of, of taking um, uh, a kind of a more mindful stance towards responding to our youth and, and it's a fun one to do. And then finally uh, are the, um, if you've never seen MTV Parental Controls, I, it was a sitcom on MTV and uh, I think there, I may still be on, I'm not sure, but there are definitely clips on YouTube that you can use and I, th I think they're pretty outrageous and pretty boundaryless and yet also uh, really current and um, uh, and then also the families as they're listening and sharing and processing together what they think, what they think about, you know, some boundary issues around that, uh, what's okay for parents to talk about, what's okay for kids to talk about. It also allows them to have the conversation uh, that's more based around what their values are as opposed to, you know, something that, that I think would be um, good. And then uh, talking about uh, what expectations are around dating and uh, lots of other good questions about being together. So um, I think it's time for questions. Uh, Kristen? Thank you so much Renee. This is actually Elisa and I am going to turn the screen over to Kristen so that she can uh, put up our slides for the question and answer. Um, and we already have a bunch of questions that have come in. Great. And I'm going to um, turn on my camera so that people can see me as well. Hello, everyone. I'm Elisa Klein. Um, and this is uh, the Q&A portion of Renee's presentation. Thank you so much, Renee. That was really um, fascinating. You have a wonderful way of sharing your expertise and uh, I really appreciate your being here. Well, thanks, Elisa. So we have a question from Angeline. She says, why isn't CPS intervention needed in most cases? What's an example of a case that wouldn't need intervention versus one that would? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, I think I can answer that in a two-pronged way. So, for instance, uh, uh, we worked with a family uh, where mom and dad were actively engaged in programming, and um, the child, one of the younger children, had one of them had acted out pretty significantly on uh, the other child, and uh, it was always a case that sort of befuddled us. We we never really could figure out why. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we always wonder, like everybody else does, even though we know, we may not know what happened. Um, so I think that was a case then, Children's Division was not involved at all with the case. It was, it was reported to, to our Children's Division by another professional, and then they were referred to us, and then the Children's Division was never involved. But I also think there are lots of other examples of, that. that's kind of an extreme example where, uh, protective service wouldn't be needed um, uh, for follow through. Although, if we had any concerns, we could have we could have reengaged them. But um, I think there's lots of you know acting out with kids that it's it happens along this continuum, 
And so, you know, super low level, curiosity stuff, uh, and yet maybe mom has an experience of having been sexually abused herself, and so when her children are maybe acting out in a natural kind of a curiosity way, um, that's hard for her, and so um, just working with us and uh, developing a way that uh, that families can be together around their bodies and that kind of thing. I don't know if that's a, a good example of what you were looking for, but I, I think that's a common one that we see specifically probably here at MOXA because we have the specialty in the uh, abuse across the continuum. Yeah, I think that does answer the question. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have a question from Cheryl. Uh, you stressed making all phases of assessment and treatment fun. Can you say more about how you do that? Sure. Um, you know, I, th I think it's just kind of an approach, maybe kind of an approach to life, which has kept me doing the work for a really long time. But, um, you know, it may just be something silly. Uh, uh, you know, you blow up a balloon and take it out to the waiting room with you and, you know, give it to one of the kids to start things with and they start bouncing around with it and, um, you know, that's fun. Um, really being careful and mindful to identify people's strengths. People really light up uh, when, when you share, even in really difficult situations, uh, something that a caregiver is doing that, that's really good. And then um, I, regardless if I see someone, when I see someone for the first time, I try to identify a really good strength that I can keep pulling through, even if, it's, even if it's that they have a dog and they really like the dog. And so then the, the next session, the, I'll start with like, how's your dog, you know? And then maybe they told a funny story about the dog and um, I said, well, he hasn't eaten any balls lately or whatever. So just also weaving in and showing that constant interest um, with people and um, and the, the interventions in the book are fun. I mean, you know, they're not like a barrel of laughs or watching a, a, a sitcom necessarily, but um, but they're fun ways to be together because I think one of the things that happens for families is that, uh, I'm trying to make this short, so I think oftentimes Mox's magic and the magic of therapists in general is that Johnny shows up or Joanna, uh, shows up and everybody around her at church, at school, at neighborhood, whatever, is like, oh, Johnny, oh, Joanna, oh, you know, trouble now, or oh, she's just a nuisance or whatever. And regardless of how the children show up here and or their caregivers, um, we are joyful about having them here and we really welcome them. Um, and... I think that supports the, the caregivers then in in not feeling so worn out by their kids. And one of the things that we see anecdotally is that um, they'll say, if they've been here for a while, they'll say, yeah, you know, we had family night and we, you know, ate popcorn or whatever. And um, and they feel prideful about that and, um, and joyful. So probably more of an answer than you wanted, but yeah. No, I think that's really important. I think, um, you know, when they're by the time they get to you too, they probably are holding so much pain and yeah. um, and so much dread and so much fear about what the process with the therapist is going to be like. That to introduce that joyfulness and that fun yeah. must be so key to setting people at ease. I think that's <laughs> wonderful, and I appreciate those those examples you gave. Good. Um, we have a question. Oh, and I just want to encourage people. We have uh, another few minutes for the question and answer. So um, please go to your control panel and put a question in if you have one. Um, we have a question from Thomas. What are the four statements that parents can make during the sexuality slide? I'm not sure I understand oh, the question completely. Yeah. But. yeah, you want me to repeat those? Uh, perhaps. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, uh, let me just uh, say really quickly, um, Kristen, we're seeing your um, your screen and we're not seeing... Okay, good. Thank you. Go ahead, Renee. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, they're just simple statements that I made up a long time ago so that this isn't like it has to be done just right or anything. So um, that's interesting. 
Um, so no matter what your kid tells you, you say, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. Um, and, or number two, can you tell me more? Can you tell me more about that? The therapists do that every day, right? <laughs> um, number three, I didn't know you thought that. Number four, uh, thanks for sharing your idea or your feeling or your opinion about that. So. Thank you. Um, a question from Amy. Have you worked with youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities who have sexual behavior problems? And if so, can you um, tell us about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think I will say that is not I don't really consider that my area of expertise. Um, however, on our staff um, and in, in our programming, we see this particular programming as being useful for that population. So um, again, it is a little bit more playful. It's not an intellectually based program other than the low cognitive distortion stuff that I had to throw in there. But um, yeah, we've had some pretty good outcomes, I think, in, in using this with kids. And then the other thing that I haven't mentioned that I should have uh, and goes with kids with developmental disabilities, I think a lot, is that, um, you know, it's short, um, it's, it's accessible, uh, it's easy to do, and um, so I think for individuals, yeah, anyway, yeah, I think it can be really successful and a lot of our therapists on staff will go to this programming uh, when they're working with a kid that uh, has some level of... And I can just um, throw in that Neary Press does offer um, a number yeah. of books that are specific to working with kids with intellectual um, and developmental disabilities, so you might want to check out some of the resources we have there. Nice. Um, let's see. Um, Lauren writes, I work in a residential placement that works specifically with juvenile offenders ages 12 to 17. Mm -hmm. As a family therapist, I often have a hard time with split families mm -hmm. when it comes to keeping both parents on the same page, especially yeah. in regard to discharge planning. Does your book mm -hmm. talk at all about working with families that are split in some way? No, it doesn't. Um... And I don't know why, because it's certainly something that that we all that we all deal with. Um, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Uh, Rex asks, what are some ways we can educate family courts on a broader scale about the realities versus myths regarding sexual misconduct by youth? So yeah. A policy question. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, um, and thank you because we, we've done a lot of work around that, and um, so I, I bet we've reached, I don't know, I don't have a number, but maybe 5,000 people in our Kansas City metro area through, uh, we started out getting ourselves invited to conferences, juvenile justice conferences, or, um, you know, going to the children's division and speaking there, uh, going to the uh, juvenile office and uh, talking individually, talking with people as groups, etc. And um, I really, I, oh, probably two weeks ago I did a training at the Children's Division and um, and there were other people of our larger system there also and I asked the question how many of you believe that when a child has experienced sexual abuse I'm sorry when a child has a sexual behavior problem they've experienced sexual abuse and only one hand went up and people were like oh not necessarily I was like oh that's great so I think we've really impacted a big culture change both in the Kansas City area and in the state of Missouri. Um, so we've also reached out a lot to therapists. On Friday I'll be doing a training uh, with my friend Matt, who's maybe listening, hi Matt, um, to a large group of 75-some therapists, um, juvenile officers, children's division workers, etc. And I just to add one other piece to that, I think people in our rural communities uh, are just really hungry uh, for information about how to respond effectively. I think people kind of intuitively get these aren't bad kids, we don't need to like, you know, lock these kids up. Um, but also I think people feel like they don't know what to do. And um, that's one of the things I, I like about this approach is I think it's something, it's just really um, accessible. So, yeah. Thank you, Renee. Good luck with that. Um, we only have another minute for the Q&A, and um, we do have quite a few more questions. 
Um, so I just want to encourage people um, to write to Renee directly. She's kind enough to offer um, to answer people's questions if you send her an email. So if we haven't covered your question on this webinar, you can write to her at rmccreary at moxa.org. So that is R-M-C-R-E-A-R-Y at M-O-C-S-A dot org. And you can ask her your questions. And uh, there's a question here that is pretty simple, I think, that we'll close down the Q&A with. And Alicia? That, yes. Uh, before we close, usually with my name I say spell it however you want it, but their, ma their mail won't get to me. <laughs> If it's misspelled, <laughs> so let me do my last name one more time. So it's R M C C R E A R Y at moxa.org. Yeah. Okay. And you know you'll be able to find information about Renee on the Neary Press uh, and Training Center website. So you'll have the correct spelling that way too. Oh, great. Um, so the last question before we close is, is your book targeted to a certain age range or certain offenses, um, as an example, adjudicated youth versus non-adjudicated? Yeah, I would definitely say it's, it's targeted towards younger children. And when I say younger, I don't mean three, um, but no, oh, six to six to an immature 13 year old, maybe immature 14 year old, and then um, uh, adjudicated or not, you know, prob probably more not, and a word that we use here that I don't really like because it's kind of a big word, but um, is less egregious kinds of struggles, so as opposed to the more egregious kinds of struggles, so I would want them, and they would probably need a higher level of care. So, Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Thank you all for these great questions, and please do write to Renee if you would like to uh, continue to have a conversation with her. So we're going to close with some of the um, housekeeping that we tend to do. Um, thank you, Renee. You can shut down your camera, as will I. And Kristen will continue to close out the webinar. Hi, everybody. I'm back for a couple minutes. Stay with us. I wanted to let everyone know that our CE process has recently changed. Paid CE credits are available for psychologists, psychiatrists, and social workers for all webinars in our 2017-2018 season. For details about how to earn your CEs, please visit nearypress.org backslash webinars and read through our new CE process before emailing us. And then if you have questions, feel free to email me at klobish at neary.com on your screen right now. I'd like to let you know that we also publish a free monthly newsletter in which we discuss a new or controversial journal article or research paper and look at its implications for clinicians and the field. You are automatically signed up for this resource, and we hope that you like it. As we mentioned in the beginning, just briefly, please think about becoming a sponsor for us this year. We're really excited to be able to present such brand new, innovative webinars every time, and we're driven by the feedback that you have provided about what topics that you've wanted. So to be able to sustain that, we really need people that are willing to step up and help us out. So if you sign up to be a sponsor, um, you will receive two Neary Press books, Current Applications and Current Perspectives, or two new books, if you already have these ones, a seat in every webinar this year. If you're an organization, that's 15 seats, and we'll do all your monthly registrations for you. So if you'd be interested, then there's an email address on the screen. We encourage you to contact us there. Thank you for the sponsors we have now. You can see them here on our screen. They are organizations, agencies, and individuals, and we could not do this without them. If you like this webinar, you can see our previous webinars on our website at nearypress.org and on Neary Press's YouTube channel. It is possible to pay for CE credits for all past recorded webinars. Again, please look at our webinars page for more details. Thank you to Renee and to Elisa for such a great webinar. And a huge thank you to everybody who is here. 
We really welcome your feedback. Please do take a couple minutes and just complete our survey at the end so that we can try and always continue to do better and have new ideas from you. And have a safe and happy holiday season. We will see you hopefully Tuesday, um, January 18th um, for our next webinar. Take it easy, everybody. Thanks for being here and have a good night.